All right. So what I want to do today is just kind of a quick and rather inadequate but hopefully helpful rehearsal of Abraham's life and the, t the setting in which he lived and at least something of what's going on in the broader world at this time. And so we're going to be kind of flying sort of low. I, I uh, hope you'll uh, uh, be able to tolerate the speed here a little bit with which we go, but hopefully this will be useful to you. We've, in the spirit of review, somebody asked me before class, do we get college credit for this course? <laughs> we'll talk. But uh, I do want to review briefly. You, this, this should all be sort of now things you're thinking about as you go to sleep at night. The first <laughs> dynasty, can you see that okay? It's, uh, is, it, uh, is it visible enough? All right. The first dynasty of Mesopotamia and really the earliest evidence of organized human civilization that's really ever been discovered is connected to Sumer. And we were saying that that goes down to about 2300 BC and it's from that point in time that we get these great epic mythical expressions of theories of creation, the flood and so on. So we've reviewed that in, in uh, weeks past. The second dynasty was called the Akkadian for its chief city which was Agad, A-G-A-D-E and it was therefore given that name, uh, the Akkadian and the main ruler there was a fellow named Sargon I. We've talked about him briefly, so this is all review. The third dynasty is of interest to us because it's organized around a city called Ur. And of course, if you're familiar with the life of Abraham, you know that he famously is from Ur of the Chaldees. That's the way it's typically referred to in the scriptures. And there's virtually no question that this is the region and the city from which Abraham hailed. So this independent, discovery of a major civilization that was connected with Mesopotamia, southern Mesopotamia, in this time frame, of course, is wonderfully confirming of the biblical account of Ur and Abraham coming from that region. Ur was the dominant city and really controlled Mesopotamian life and politics for a couple of hundred years, and then it fell to external invaders who didn't stay, they just sort of pillaged and went home, and that brings us to a fourth era, which was called an intermediate period. Now, intermediate is a term used in ancient Near Eastern studies to mean that there was no overarching, dominating central authority. It sort of decentralized into something almost uh, somewhat chaotic, really, in which you had a lot of little cities all vying for control, but no one really rising to the surface to more or less extend its authority over other regions. Mesopotamia generally came under two cities. One was called Isin, I-S-I-N, which was in the south, and another called Eshnuna, E-S-H-N-U-N-N-A, which was in the north. But basically, neither of these had dominating authority. Isin, for its part, kind of faded by about the year 924. Abraham, by our best reckoning, was born around the year 1951 BC. So Abraham is born at a time when he's kind of in the shadow of the former glory of Ur, but the immediate circumstances of his life are a time in which things are really devolving into a certain degree of decentralized and somewhat chaotic life. We know from other sources that migration from Mesopotamia at this time was quite common that lots of people were leaving Mesopotamia because of the instability that had set in. When we hear in the scriptures that along the way, Terah, the father of Abraham and his family, migrated away, we're not surprised because all kinds of people were doing that. It was, it was almost the spirit of the age to go and find greener pastures, as it were. So we have Abram born into this situation, which is a little bit topsy-turvy, and we'll see a little bit more of his life in a moment. The next major dynasty that comes along, which we won't deal with today, but just so you're, you see it coming, is called the Old Babylonian. The Old Babylonian begins around 1830, 40, something like that, BC, and extends clear down to around 1600 BC. Old Babylon is not to be confused with Neo-Babylon, which was the renewed and revived Babylonian Empire, the most famous king of which, deported, 
the people of Jerusalem and scattered them in Babylon and elsewhere. His name is Nebuchadnezzar, the most famous king of old Babylon, some eight or nine hundred years earlier, was a guy who wrote a very famous, the first really well-constructed ancient written code, and it represents what you might say the first stab at rule of law in the ancient world, and for that reason the person has been rightly acknowledged as a great lawgiver and king and so on. And many people have thought that Moses borrowed from this famous king, and that famous king's name is Hammurabi. Thank you, very good. And so the most uh, well-known ruler of the old uh, Babylonian dynasty is Hammurabi. I want to look at Hammurabi next week, and I want to look at the alleged correlations between Hammurabi's code and the Mosaic code. There are certainly some points of comparison. Again, we're going to find some points of, I think, considerable distinction between the two. One thing is clear, Hammurabi came at least 200 years before Moses, and so once again we're dealing with what could definitely be a, a contributing source, but we'll save that discussion for a little later. So, that's the basic lay of the land. We have Abraham born now about 1951. If you want to jump in a plane with me and go on a little trip to Iraq, uh, we can tour around southern Mesopotamia, and if we came to Ur, this is what we would see. It still is pretty well preserved, considering how ancient it is. We still find a lot of evidence of the civilization that was once there that would date clear back to the time of Abraham. That building that you see off in the distance there is the ziggurat that we've seen in other photos in prior weeks. It's the dominant structure in that region, but you can see a whole lot of other evidence of a civilized uh, you know, location uh, if we were to visit there today. The trip that uh, Abraham made was, of course, with his father. It seems that this would have been about 1917 B.C., when Abraham is probably about between 30 and 40 years old. The last part of Genesis 11 tells us that it was Terah who packed up his family and left Ur. It seems as if he was the patriarch at that, one, at that point, the father of Abraham, and hauled everybody off to go to greener pastures. And they went to a city called Haran, H-A-R-A-N. It looks like Haran. It's usually pronounced Haran. You have to kind of growl the H there. This was a, uh, a major trading point. You can tell from the uh, way the map is laid out that there would have been a great deal of trade coming from the north and from the south, from all points. They sort of met in this region. So at that time, it was uh, quite a well-known location. Again, if we were to take our little tour of the Middle East and visit, visit this site, we would see a fair number of rather impressive ruins there at Quran. This would be one of many, the re remains of a temple that was there. The uh, structures in the, in the uh, habitated part of it look probably a lot like what Abraham himself would have seen. This is a shot of a marketplace in that region. Today it still is inhabited. The major religion in Quran was a, uh, a worship of the moon god whose name was Nana, N-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, otherwise known as Sin, S-I-N, and there's no connection between that word linguistically and our word Sin. It just happens to be a coincidence of language that those words look the same. But this particular uh, female deity, this goddess, oversaw worship, and especially there in Haran, her major temple was uh, constructed and it was a very important place for more or less celebrating her. This is a very typical kind of relief indicating worship as it was conceived of. So this god who's seated here, best guess is, is the god Shamash, which is a sun god. This god is being approached by a lesser deity here, this one, who is an intermediary, and then the actual worshiper is back here, representing others that are back yet. So you can see the hand holding here. Here's a lower deity bringing a worshiper to a higher deity, and all of it is being overseen by Nana, who's pictured as that little moon god. This is typical ancient Near Eastern religion. There was an understanding of a hierarchy of deities, and the idea was that you wouldn't get the attention of the higher deity directly. They were much too busy. So you go to lesser deities that aren't so busy, that have time on their hands, and you appeal to them. 
and you try to get the ear of the lesser deity and you give certain offerings to that one in the hopes that that one will then bring you into the presence of the higher deity who has the authority to grant your request. So it is this kind of pecking order view of religion and I think it should help us again appreciate as Christians who follow a biblical approach to worship to appreciate this rather striking idea that we can come boldly into the very presence of God. Most religious schemes in the world don't see it that way. There are even other Christian traditions that don't quite see it that way. But the idea that we can come into the very presence of God and that we can pray to him and have his immediate and undivided attention is a rather astonishing concept and certainly would be foreign to the ancient Near Eastern understanding of worship as we find it depicted here. Well, they are there for some years, 30 years or so. Tira, the father, dies, and it's at this time, apparently, that Abraham heard his call. It's not altogether clear from the text, but it seems more probable that the call of Abraham took place while he was in this city of Haran and told him to leave that place, which was a well-established and rather uh, lucrative, I suppose, setting for him, and to go down into what probably seemed to him at the time as a bit of a hinterland down toward Canaan. So you can see the, uh, the uh, map, and, and this is the Fertile Crescent, of course, so Abraham really is just following what was kind of the, um, in that day, was considered to be the, the best place to live in terms of the production of food and so on. So he comes down to a place called Shechem. Shechem is pictured here. There's still people that live there and the ruins of the ancient world are still available. These two mountains that you see back here are, are, whoops, are well known. This one on the left is called Gerizim and this one on the right is called Ebal. You may recall in the, New, or in the Old Testament account of the conquest under Joshua, the people of God come in and they park between these two mountains. Gerizim and Ebal and some of the priests stand on Gerizim and they call out the blessings that will come to the people on the basis of their obedience and then others priests stand on Ebal and they call out the curses that will come to the people for disobedience and the picture that's given to us biblically is these two mountains are opposite each other and there's a valley between them and that's exactly the way the topography reflects it here so you can imagine these great numbers of people out there hearing alternatively the blessing from the one hand and the curse from the other and of course the response that the people give to confirm their covenant obligations in that setting was simply what the one word amen and that comes down to us let all the people say amen you know well that's where that phrase originated when these people would say amen and that was in a sense signing their names and undertaking the responsibility of life here. This is another shot of Shechem. This wall that's here actually dates back to the Bronze Age, which would be not far from the time of Abraham, and it uh, reflects the fact that it itself required this kind of defensive fortifications. Also in the background, once again, you see Gerizim, and this may also remind you of the story of Jesus when he was with the woman at the well there in Samaria and she raises the question when she detects that he's a prophet she says to him you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem but our father said we should worship at this mountain well the this mountain that she was referring to could only be Gerizim and so it tells us that once again it was probably in this immediate vicinity that that conversation with the woman at the well took place all right, so Abraham's there for a little less than a year. A famine sets in. This is all in Genesis chapter 12. And Abraham makes a further little trip down to Egypt. Now, just a heads up, I'm not going to do much with Egypt this morning because next week we're going to do Hammurabi, and then after that we're going to do Egypt. Basically, we'll spend about four weeks dealing with Egypt and its connections with biblical history. That's chapter 2 if you're following in the book. So... I'm not going to, I just want to make a little kind of brief mention of Egypt here, but uh, this would probably have taken place during what's called the 12th dynasty, and if our chronology is right, then the trip would have been during the reign of a pharaoh by the name of Zenusret III, who ruled until 1841. He was the greatest ruler of the 12th dynasty, and it's this that gives rise to the story of 
the Pharaoh wanting to include Sarah in his harem. You recall that. And of course, Abraham had already set this up in advance by saying to Sarah, tell everybody you're my sister. You remember that well-known story on the part of Abraham and his duplicity there. You might wonder, you know, could Abraham have been that important that he would have caught the notice of a pharaoh, uh, arguably one of the most powerful men in the world? And the answer is yes. Abraham, by the at least hints that we have biblically, was not just a wandering Bedouin, you know. He had several thousands of people with him. He was the sheik of a fairly sizable community. We find plenty of evidence that it's more or less uh, implicit, but certainly we find evidence of it sufficient to suggest that when Abraham came to town, he would be regarded even by someone like Pharaoh as someone of some importance, some authority, some prestige, someone with whom it would be in the Pharaoh's interest to enter into a kind of treaty and what better way to do that than to take the sister of Abraham and bring, him, bring her into his harem, you know. And so that seems to be exactly what happened before there could be any intimacy between this fellow and um, Sarah. As you know, God intervened and brought plagues uh, of some description onto Senyusret, and uh, I hope you're familiar with that story generally. There's nothing of that in Egyptian records, nothing, but we're not surprised at that. You know, this is not the kind of thing that would necessarily make it into Egyptian records, but the biblical account, at least, is somewhat compatible with what we might otherwise expect to have happened. Abraham leaves. Within a year, he comes back. We're told biblically he was greatly increased in his um, uh, possessions and so on. He comes back to a region around the Dead Sea, a little north of it, and it's there in chapter 13 that Lot and Abraham part company. Again, the hint at their wealth is, is pretty significant. They have so much in terms of flocks and herds that the land can't support both of them. So Lot tends to head south toward the Dead Sea region. Abraham heads more north back toward Shechem. The location of Gomorrah and Sodom has been generally agreed upon to be these two. This is on the banks of the Red Sea. These are, of course, ruins. Uh, Gomorrah here, Sodom here, a little town called Zoar, which is up there. And uh, it seems that that is then where Lot moved. And of course, he was a man of considerable wealth at that time as well. So they arrive in that region. Lot settles, apparently becomes something of a fairly conspicuous guy around town. And Genesis 14 then tells us of an incident that took place about seven years later, about 1867, in which those two cities were attacked by some kings that are said to be from Mesopotamia. Now the word kings in that case means something more like a sheik, somebody who is over a good-sized community, something like Abraham himself. The name that's given is Chedorlaomer. This is really similar to Amorite names such as Kadur, uh, Kolomer, and that's probably the best guess as to the identity. It would suggest this was an Amorite. The Amorites were a tribal group that lived in the north of Canaan in Mesopotamia. They eventually become the people that create the Assyrian Empire. So they were a fairly widespread group of people, and Genesis 15 actually mentioned them, you may recall, right there. So these, this coalition comes down, they attack Sodom and Gomorrah, they take people away. We wouldn't care much about it except, of course, Along with the goods and people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they also take Lot and his family. And that causes Abraham to get involved. And Abraham musters a small army. Again, notice this. The biblical text tell, tells us that uh, Abraham mustered an army of 318 men, warriors, born in his house. And that in itself, again, is rather telling, isn't it? How many people would there be in a community such that you would have 318, essentially a small standing army, serving at the you know, instance of Abraham? Again, it indicates to us that he was more than just kind of a guy living out in a tent by himself. And, and uh, so he goes off and, of course, is able in a kind of sneak attack to defeat these and bring back the goods, and that gives rise to this fascinating story, Genesis 14, in which Abraham is confronted by two kings as he returns from this great victory. One is the king of Sodom, and one is the king of Salem. 
And these two guys show up, Genesis 14, and put Abraham to his first real test. Who is Abraham going to recognize? With whom is he going to enter into some kind of, of uh, treaty relationship here? Sodom is playing the card that, okay, Abraham, you're a great guy. Wow, you're impressive. Let's, uh, let's enter into some kind of relationship and have a treaty and so on. And he makes that kind of appeal to Abraham's ego. Salem, the king of Salem, whose name, by the way, is Melchizedek, comes and will have none of it. He says to Abraham, it's the Lord Most High who's given you this victory, and you need to acknowledge that by simply freely giving a gift of 10% of, the, of that which you've acquired in this contest. And Abraham, of course, opts for Salem and not for Sodom, and that becomes a major moment that leads us then to chapter 15, which takes place the very next year, in which Abraham has this covenant-cutting moment between himself and the Lord God Almighty. So it's right after the defeat of the coalition of the kings, it's right after his choice to go with Melchizedek and not with the king of Sodom. Apparently within just a few months of that, if the chronology is, is uh, accurately computed here, is when God comes to Abram now, as we saw in chapter 15, and says to him, I'm gonna bless you, I'm gonna make you a mighty nation, you're going to be just you know, this incredible patriarch. And of course, Abraham is concerned because he's thinking, yeah, but where's numero uno, you know? With all of these children I'm supposed to have, it'd be nice if we could start with one. And uh, so far he has no children. And so he raises a kind of protest here. How can this happen? Seeing that I have no seed, I have no children. The one that's going to inherit my goods is Eliezer of Damascus, a servant born in my own house. And that would have been the typical custom in that day at that time. And of course, God's response to him is, Eliezer is not going to be your heir, but one who is the issue of your own body, you see. And Abraham is said to believe in the Lord at that point, and God credits that to him as righteousness. And my friends, that is why, that's one reason why Sproul wanted this chapter on his desert island. And that's another reason is why this is a, the Apostle Paul's favorite verse in the whole Old Testament. He quotes this verse more than any other single verse in all of his writings in the New Testament. Genesis 15, 6. And we love to hear it. We love to hear that Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness because that, my friends, is called justification by faith alone. And that is good news. And we would think that would settle the discussion, wouldn't we? But notice verse 7. Abraham comes back and says, yeah, but how can I know? Well, wait a minute, Abraham. You just believed in the Lord. It was just credited to you for righteousness. What's this? How can I know? And we would almost expect God to come back and say, now look, Abraham, I said it. You believe it? That settles it. Come on. My word is sufficient for you. But God now goes the second mile. And this is what makes this story so amazing. Is that God doesn't say, okay, now, Abraham, you're just, you're just pushing your luck here. You're being impudent. So he doesn't do that. He says, okay, Abraham, in the style of ancient Near Eastern uh, uh, customary uh, covenant-cutting ceremonies between authorities, sheiks, suzerains, you go and get some animals. Abraham knew exactly what this meant. He went and he got some animals. You have to think of it, this was a bloody mess. Take these animals, cut them in two, longitudinally, and split them. Can you imagine that? Ah. I mean, I get an uneasy stomach just thinking about this, and this is... And, and it creates this, so you've got these several halves of animals laying out there, and it creates literally a kind of bloody pathway right down the middle, doesn't it? Blessings, choir. Now, what happened in the ancient Near East was if you had two rulers who were going to form a covenant, the term that was used would be to cut a covenant. And that's exactly what happened. They would cut these animals, and they would create a bloody pathway, 
and then these two rulers would take off their shoes and walk barefoot down through the middle of this bloody pathway that they had created. We know this from wonderful scholarship that's been done. Uh, you may know the name of Meredith Klein, for example, who's a great scholar of the 20th century who did a whole lot of work in this area, and many others have followed, and we have a pretty good idea of how these sorts of covenants were created at that time, and that's what they would do. And essentially what they were saying in covenantal language was, if I, a ruler, walking through these animals and their blood and guts and all of that, if I don't perform what I've promised, then may I be rent asunder like these animals have been. May the gods do the same thing to me as I've done to these animals if I don't perform my covenant obligations here. And both kings would make that promise, you see. That's pretty heavy stuff. What's interesting is that Abraham has a covenant-cutting ceremony, but, of course, there's a surprising you know, difference. Abraham, does he walk up and down through the animals? Does he? No. God puts him to sleep. I don't mean that in the, you know, you know what I mean. God he doesn't put him to sleep like you put a dog to sleep, but God puts him to sleep. Abraham is asleep. He's passive. He doesn't walk up and down through these, you know, cut up animals. And then in a vision, in this time of sleeping, he sees what's happening. And what happens is a smoking furnace and a burning torch, the two principal theophanies in the Old Testament standing for the presence of God, pass up and down through the pieces. This is called a unilateral covenant. This is one party making all the promises to the other one. And the other one is not being obligated to anything at this point. He's sleeping. God says, I will do this. And he swore by himself, you see. He took an oath based on his own character that he would do this. The book of Hebrews dramatizes this and says, so that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, he made these promises so that we might have great comfort as those who are in the covenant of Abraham. We are part of that covenant, you see. What are the two immutable things? God's word and then the sacrament. That covenant-cutting ceremony, a sacramental promise in which God guarantees that he's going to do the things that he said. And we, of course, celebrate that as God's people. We have both of these wonderful expressions of that which God has given us as guarantees of his promises and the faithful performance of them to us. It's also interesting, however, to see that the way in which this was done was very customary at that day. So that's the uh, covenant-cutting ceremony that we just read of. I don't think Abraham quite understood how this seed was going to come because virtually at the same time, or just shortly thereafter, we have the birth of Ishmael, you see. Remember, Genesis 15 doesn't mention Sarah. And so Abraham probably thought to himself, well, Sarah hasn't had any children, and so I'm going to use a customary practice that is not uncommon around here, and I'm going to take as a concubine my wife's handmaid and have a child by her. And apparently Abraham, at least for a time, thought that Ishmael would be the seed through whom all these promises would come. You're aware, of course, that the Arab nations generally trace their heritage back to Ishmael, that the Quran, holy book of Islam, specifically states that it's out of Ishmael that these nations have originated and actually claims that Ishmael was the child of promise, that the Old Testament that we read got it wrong. So Ishmael is a prominent character and he's born probably about 1865, then just after this moment of Genesis 15. The covenant of circumcision seems to come some years later, maybe 10 or 12 years later. This is God now confirming in this rite of circumcision the promises that he's made. And the rite of circumcision, again, becomes the standard Old Testament rite, you might say, that distinguishes the people of God from that point on. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4 makes quite a point out of the fact that circumcision came to Abraham after he had been justified by faith. It's not a cause of, but a confirmation of his acceptance before God, even though the subsequent generations typically were circumcised before faith. 
That's part of how we as Presbyterians, it's part of how we justify, of course, the practice of infant baptism. We believe that baptism is appropriate for an adult after they've come to faith, but we also believe that in a believing household, it's appropriate to baptize an infant, just as in the Old Testament, they circumcised an infant. That's a separate consideration, but I know you're familiar with that. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah seems to take place about that time, about 1850. Archaeological evidence would put it about the same time frame. It's an interesting place to visit. I've never been there, but I hear that uh, it looks like there was a huge catastrophe there, you know. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what the nature of the catastrophe was. It looks like something like a volcanic eruption, maybe. It's the kind of thing you'd find at Pompeii, which was, of course, buried in volcanic ash for many years. That sort of thing seems to be characteristic here. Whether it was a volcano, whether God, by fiat, simply brought fire and brimstone out of the sky, I'll leave that to your own musings. But in any event, the locations of these two cities do seem to both reflect uh, some kind of cataclysm that would have taken place at about that time. This is one shot of uh, Gomorrah in the Dead Sea region. The other one, uh, this is actually the remains of a kind of ziggurat that was present there in Gomorrah. Uh, you've got a government sign sitting there saying, don't trespass, and then lots of people back there trespassing, but uh, there you are. And that brings us uh, then to the birth of Isaac, which takes place in uh, about the same time, if you recall the story as it's recorded in Genesis, Abraham was visited by three angels, and they have a conversation with Abraham about the events that are going to take place in Sodom and Gomorrah, but they also have a conversation with respect to the fact that Abraham is going to have a son by Sarah. And of course, Sarah herself is finding that rather hard to believe. She's 90 years old at that time. Abraham is about 100. Not that in those days that was beyond the age of, you know, people live longer apparently back then than they do now. So it wasn't out of hand impossible that there would have been a child, but it would seem after so many years of hoping and wishing and trying to have children without success, it would seem unlikely that it would happen at this late date. But in fact, we do have the birth of Isaac then that takes place in the uh, following year. And you may recall as a result of that, we have Ishmael and his family, uh, Hagar and so on, are driven out. And that, that separation really of Abraham and his family and Ishmael and the rest takes place then. The final uh, story that really occupies our attention with respect to Abraham is this moment in which God comes to him and says, okay, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son that you love, up on a mountain, offer him there as a sacrifice. I know that from the point of view of a thoughtful reader, especially from a New Testament point of view, I've, I've heard it said, and I've probably said it myself, how could God ever require or even request or ask such a thing of anybody? You know, how could God come to this man who's now had many years of faithful service, etc., down through the, the, uh, the timeline of his life, and require of him to take this son now, who's probably in his mid-teens, maybe 12, 13 years old, and offer him on a mountain as a sacrifice. It's a deep text. I've heard it preached on. I've preached on it myself occasionally over the years, and I'm still not sure I get it. It's a, a powerful text that probes very deeply to the very heart of faith and what faith requires. The fact that it comes to us from this era is, it makes it even more remarkable. I think it is helpful to know give fully satisfying explanation of it, but it's certainly helpful to know that child sacrifice was fairly common in Canaanite religion in that time. This was something that was done. It was, it's grotesque, it's horrible, it's horrific, but it was not uncommon. The religious schemes of that day understood that the gods needed to be fed and the most valuable feeding that you could do of a god if you were in truly desperate circumstances would be to offer a human being. That was just part of their understanding of religious worship. At this point, we're very early in redemptive history. We don't know exactly how much Abraham knew about the god that he was worshiping. It may have come to him as a big shock and yet not a completely unexpected demand that God would say to him, I want you to take this son, you're, tr you're prized, possession and offer this one in sacrifice to me. We're told in the New Testament that 
Abraham believed that God would bring that child back. And so that must have been something of what was in his mind. The astonishing thing about the story, of course, is that without any apparent protest, Abraham takes his son, and off they go to a place called Moriah, which traditionally is where the temple was eventually built. At the very moment when Abraham was about to take the life of his son, God stays his hand, and there's a substitute. And that has, from a New Testament point of view, become the probably most dramatic paradigm to picture what happened many hundreds of years later at virtually the same location when a father took his only begotten son, the son whom he loved, and took him out there. But in that case, he did not stay his hand. He did, in fact, take the life of his son. And what Abraham said to Isaac on that day, the Lord will provide, was graphically realized when God indeed did provide by giving his own son in sacrifice at that moment. So even though the, the story presents for us huge mysteries, at the same time it becomes this remarkable image of what has taken place in, in our own redemption, that God spared not his own son, that we through faith might enter into connection with him and thereby become, as Paul says, seed of Abraham and heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham and his seed.